My name is Johanna Miller Lewis, and I'm professor of history at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Today is February 4th, 2006, and I'm interviewing Elizabeth Eckford, one of the Little Rock Nine, for the Central High uh, Historic Site Oral History Project. So we will begin at the beginning, and I will ask you um, when and where you were born. I, I was born in Little Rock um, in 1941. Can you tell me a little bit about what your neighborhood um, and home were like when you were growing up? Okay. Um, for the first eight years, we lived half a block from Dunbar on Wright Avenue. And on my, on, uh, in October of um, 1949, we moved to um, the house where I live now. Uh, it was at 4405 West 18th, and that then was called the West End part of town. And in my neighborhood, uh, there was a huge pine forest um, at the end of the block, and that's where the Girl Scouts would go for encampments. And uh, the rest of the neighborhood consisted of older homes. There were clusters of one ethnic group and another, and the only separation was that at the end of a white neighborhood, the pavement would stop, and then the um, Negro neighborhood would start with um, uh, dirt streets at first. And then uh, I remember around election time, there would be a truck would come around, put some oil down on the dust. And as the years went by, those dirt streets became gravel roads. And then, oh, maybe 30, 40 years later, they finally were paved streets. Mm -hmm. By then, the complexity of the neighborhood had changed. Mm -hmm. um, in 1951, where there had been a pine forest, uh, an all new, new white development was built. And that, um, um, my street dead ended there. And we saw the back of that development. It was called Pine Forest. And it was all white by 1963. Um, blacks began moving into that, and very, very soon um, the neighborhood changed um, ethnically. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any particular uh, childhood um, memories or experiences um, that stand out in your in your mind, playing in the pine forest or, or something? Um, I'll, I'll, I think the person who's most central to our family for more than one generation was my grandfather. And my grandfather um, had a store half a block from Dunbar, and we lived uh, a couple doors down from him. And then when he moved his store in 1955 um, to another part of town, um, we always would go to uh, my grandfather's store on Sundays. And uh, in, in the year in which there was no school, I spent a lot of time at my grandfather's store. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it a grocery store? It was a neighborhood grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather, over the years, always had something else going. Uh, he had a cafe attached, or, or and it's the, the, at the end of his life, he was selling barbecue sandwiches. One time he had a barber shop there. He always had something else going mm -hmm. within the confines of the store. Mm -hmm. And um, who shopped at the store? Was it uh, people in the neighborhood? And we did uh, because we had to go to Papa's store <laughs> out of family loyalty. <laughs> Even when we were shopping at the supermarket, uh -huh. we always went and bought something at Grand at Papa's store. <laughs> oh, um, tell me about your your family. Who were your parents? Uh, my parents were um, native of Kansas. My father it was Oscar Eckford Jr. And he was born in Forest City, Arkansas, but grew up in Little Rock mm -hmm. and went to Little Rock schools. My mother was born um, near Pettis, Arkansas, in Lono County. I think it's Lono County. But she always rephrased phrase it as down below Anglin, meaning England and Arkansas. And she came to Little Rock as a teenager in order to go to high school because there was no schooling past the eighth grade where she lived. Mm -hmm. And so did both of them attend Dunbar? Yes, they did. Um, what um, uh, did you learn and hear about uh, Dunbar uh, before you got to go there? In okay, um, I knew 
uh, that my mother's experience was not unique. Dunbar still exists today, I think, because um, the generations of people uh, who would not allow it to be torn down. I know that Dunbar provided the finest education a Negro could get anywhere in Arkansas. I know that there's a whole generation of, of my mother's age who left small town Arkansas to come to Little Rock, got jobs, found places to live, to support themselves in order to get a high school education. And um, I attended Dunbar from seventh through ninth grade, but it had, when I first started there, it was a six-year high school. Mm -hmm. It was the only high school for Negro students in, Arca in Little Rock. Mm -hmm. So that um, my ninth grade class was the first junior high school graduation class from Dunbar in 1956. Okay. So and you most of the teachers, a lot of the teachers, had been my parents' teachers. Mm -hmm. So that um, even in elementary school, some of those people had been my parents' teachers. They had taught at high school before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you were attending Dunbar Junior High um, when it ceased to be a high school yes. and a junior college. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? I remember about that there that? was a junior college. I remember my aunt, my mother's youngest sister, went to school there. But that's a, and I, my first recollection that. Something else was going on in Dunbar is when we lived on Wright Avenue and I was a little kid, I would see these veterans in the khaki uniforms mm -hmm. going to school at nine. I guess to get there, finish high school or to take some junior college courses. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, yeah, GI Bill. Um, uh, tell me about your brothers and sisters. Um, I'm part of the Eckford Half Dozen. I have three brothers and two sisters. And um, people used to refer to us as, as one of the experts. <laughs> and um, their ages and uh, names? I have an older sister, Anna, who has always been my spokesman. She could intercede with, with my parents for me because I was a very, very shy, submissive child. So it was Anna who worked on my parents to get permission to go to Central High School. Because the yes. first time, my mother said, she didn't say no. I call her the queen of no. She didn't say no. She said, we'll see. And that dragged on and on and on. And um, in fact, um, I didn't make the final decision to go to um, Central until late into the summer mm -hmm. before school opened. And I remember that we had um, interviews with the superintendent, Virgil Blossom, we may have had interviews with the um, school board, but I don't remember very much about those interviews at all. Mm -hmm. I remember that at some point it was announced that we were not be, would not be able to um, participate in extracurricular activities, mm -hmm. and um, that the number of people who intended to go got smaller. But this wasn't wasn't of concern to me because the Queen of No wouldn't have let me be <laughs> away from home at night and some school activity anyway. <laughs> okay, so Anna's your older sister. Uh huh. And I have three brothers. Um, they're uh, they're all younger than me. I have a sister who's nine years younger. Mm hmm. And um, they also attended Dunbar. Um, my. Youngest siblings, a brother and a sister, uh, when they were in junior high schools, the um, junior high schools were desegregated. So they went to West Side, which was the closest high school mm -hmm. to them, closest junior high to them. And um, my youngest brother was in school at the time that Metropolitan was open right. as, a, as a vocational school. So he went to high school there. My middle brother was uh, one of three boys that desegregated um, Little Rock Votech mm -hmm. High School. It was an old boys high school. Hmm. And um, he graduated from high school in 1968. Okay. Um, it, let me go back for, for just a minute. Do you know um, at, at Dunbar, um, in, in, for the high school, they had um, different tracks. They had a college 
prep track, a regular high school track, and then they had a vocational track? I wasn't aware of that. I knew that there were vocational courses there, yeah. like carpentry, auto mechanics, and right. bricklaying, and printing, uh, which at that time were only for male students, and I knew that they had typing courses. <laughs> but I wasn't aware that, they were, that there were different um, instructional levels mm -hmm. at school at all. Okay. Um, so in your neighborhood, I'm, I'm sure you had uh, had friends, and um, what were some of the things you did when you were, were growing up? Um, I was a Brownie Scout, and our troop leader lived um, two half blocks and a block away. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that my mother, um, this, my mother respected this lady because she was a PTA worker, mm -hmm. and my mother was active in the PTA. So she respected her. But uh, my mother was an overly cautious person. She would always ask us detailed questions about what happened when we got back home from, from Brownie Scout meeting. And I remember um, that by the time I was a Brownie Scout, I, I could sew doll, doll clothes. <laughs> Excellent. Where did, the brownie, where did the brownies meet? At, um, at Mrs. Brown's house on, on 20th Street. Okay. And I lived on 18th Street. Excellent. Um, you, uh, in in terms of um, uh, family, both um, uh, your immediate family and, and extended family, who were the people in your in your life um, that were the most important to you and sort of shaping you as a person and your values? I think uh, probably my parents. And I, I realized this <laughs> in my senior years because um, my sister and I were always, my sister was always trying to bring them into the 20th century. They, they were, <laughs> they, were um, they were benevolent despots. <laughs> we were brought up in a very, very strict old fashioned household. Mm -hmm. Uh, the experts are talkers, so we, our dinner conversations would be about what was in the news, what was happening in the, na in the neighborhood. And um, we could never, ever contradict our parents, but we could ask questions, though. <laughs> um, when you were growing up, um, what were your um, plans for the future? Um, I grew up and I, I would think about it today, and it's kind of, kind of unusual, I think. I grew up with the understanding that I ought to go to college, I should go to college, and that I would go to college, all the while knowing that my parents could not afford to send me to college. Mm -hmm. But my grandfather always stressed that, that further education was the road to opportunity. And um, he always thought I, that I should be a teacher because that that was a role that he admired and it was something that he could see as a possibility for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you have uh, already mentioned some about um, the neighborhood um, where you lived um, having different clusters of homes of um, different um, ethnic um, uh, makeup. Um, what? How often did you um, come into contact sort of with, with segregation um, when you were uh, growing up? It was always part of, part of my world. Um, when I was very little, my mother used to take us to the Negro Library, which was um, located in the Negro uh, section of town, the, the, the um, I guess the heart of, of the Negro neighborhood. It was on what was then High, High Street, now mm -hmm. Martin Luther King uh, Street, and it was near Baptist College, mm -hmm. which is a private, uh, small Negro college. And I remember that uh, the, the theater, that, that there was a, a, an all-black theater on 9th Street, and that there were uh, black businesses on 9th Street, and the dentists, the um, doctors, and so forth were on 9th Street. Uh, but I remember that in my neighborhood, when, I went, when we went to the movies, that we sat in the balcony. That was the only place we were allowed to sit. Uh, did you um, shop downtown? Yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. But I don't, the only thing I remember um, of segregation from 
the stores downtown, I remember that at one time there were water fountains marked colored and, and white. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember whether or not we were prohibited from trying on clothes. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that because I think probably uh, the only thing we would have to try on would be shoes. I don't know we tried on shoes. Was everything else uh, we made our clothes, mm -hmm. or my mother made them sure. until we got to the point where our sewing was sufficient for us to mm -hmm. sew our own clothing. Sure. Did you get to take the infamous home ec classes at Dunbar? Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. But I, um, my mother at one point had been a dressmaker. Oh. She taught us to sew. It was something that we always liked to do. It mm -hmm. wasn't a chore. And I remember that um, there was a store downtown called the Fabric Center, and my mother had always taught us uh, how to determine quality of clothing. Mm -hmm. And I remember the tactile pleasures I would have walking through the store, stroking, <laughs> stroking silk and yeah. the finest <laughs> wools and so forth. Absolutely. <laughs> um, how much of a role did religion play in your family? I, I guess I guess um, it was something that kind of was taken for granted. That this is this mm -hmm. is part of the part of the ordinary routine of everybody mm -hmm. going to church, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, in a way a kind of social out outlet for us because they had a children's choir. Mm -hmm. um, they may have had um, some kind of meeting during the week for teenagers. Uh -huh. And I remember um, that at one point we had young ministers, too, who were um, ministers of our church mm -hmm. they, while they were students at Blander, sure. the, uh, the Cone brothers. Um, James Cone now is a, a famous um, black re liberation theologist. And he was uh, one of the um, ministers at Allen Temple, the small church I went to within the neighborhood. It was it was close to Stevens, the elementary school that I went to. Okay. All right. So you went to Stevens. Mm -hmm. um, so that would have been grades one through five. Grades one through six. Then. Grades one through six. Uh -huh. Okay. And I when the first year I went, I was in the I was um, I had moved from Gibbs to um, Stevens because we moved that year in nineteen. 49. We moved in October. And I remember that um, Stevens w was a wo white wooden building. And the next year, they built the new school, a brick building. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gibbs had been, uh, I think, a two-story two old school house that was brick on the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you mentioned earlier um, your, your grandfather's um, uh, belief that education was the, the key to um, um, sort of succeeding in, in life. My parents believe that too. And so... Um, so the education wasn't taken for granted. It was, um, it was always stressed to us that not only this is how you better yourself, but that this is something nobody could ever take away from you. Mm -hmm. So um, we were working class people, I guess, with some middle class aspirations. My father worked for the railroad, and then he had a second job working as a, a, what you would describe as a houseman, I guess, mm -hmm. in, in, in a couple of homes where they had um, household staffs. And my mother, um, for a long time, was... Um, the laundry operator at the school for the deaf and blind, where my brother went to school, and it was within walking distance of our home. Mm -hmm. And she also was a, a a maid in this in a house in this neighborhood, a white neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, half a block from us. Mm -hmm. um, so, did your brothers and sisters? I'm assuming all of them went to school. And yes. Did uh -huh. they go to college as well? My um, my um, middle brother, the one who went to this desegregated boys school left Little Rock the day after graduation and he um, over the years acquired a junior college education um, but he but he also acquired um, um, expertise in 
auto mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, for a long time, well, we first started out being a uh, mechanic helper at the fire department, mm -hmm. and then eventually he was a truck mechanic, and eventually he was uh, supervising mechanics. And his last job, he uh, was in management. He supervised, not directly supervised, did the administration for five groups of craftspeople for the harbor department in Los Angeles, the ships, carpenters, carpenters, electricians, uh, welders, and so forth. Um, that's the job he retired from, and he's still in California. Mm -hmm. And my, middle, my um, youngest brother moved to California right after graduation, and he was drafted into the Army. Mm -hmm. Was the moving a result of anything specific or just my brother, out of the South? My brother, like me, wanted to be outside the South for, because of sure. the horrible experiences he had in high school. Um, he, he wouldn't even go, go. He had a scholarship to Fisk, but he, mm -hmm. didn't, he didn't want to be in the South at sure. all. Um, okay, so... Uh, moving forward um, uh, a little bit, we uh, talked about you going to, to Dunbar for, for junior high. Um, what did you know about um, Central or Little Rock Senior High um, uh, before you went there? Well, it was um, kind of located midway between um, downtown and our house or midway between um, our house and my grandfather's store. Mm -hmm. So I passed by it all the time. The neighborhood was familiar. I knew that some of my neighbors, the, the white neighbors I had, went to Central High School. So even though I was a real shy person and I was going to a much bigger school when I applied to go to Central, I expected to see some familiar faces. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, did it have any other um, type of significance to you? I mean, no. besides? Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -mm. Uh, except that um, I knew that in segregation, um, what the whites had was always more and better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I went to Central because I, expect, I wanted to be better prepared to go to college. Sure. But I didn't, know any, I didn't have any specific knowledge about what was offered at Central. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you or your family belong to the NAACP, the local chapter? My father says that he was a member, but I wasn't aware of it. My father is a joiner, so he may have joined. In, I, I, he wasn't active in it, I know that, mm -hmm. before um, my, uh, we, we turned to the NAACP because of the opposition against us and when we, were, when we didn't get into school. But we were, I, I know that I knew who the Bates were because we read their paper, paper and their pictures were always in the paper, but I had never met them before my attempt to go to Central. Okay. And, and was it a case of, of um, you and either your family or other members of the Nine turning to them or the NAACP coming to you? We turned to them. Okay. I, rem I, know, I remember distinctly that uh, on September 4th, the day I tried to go to school and was turned away, that that evening my m father took me to the Bates house, that's, and that's when we met them. Okay. But I had seen Mr. Bates while I was waiting for the bus to take me away from Central. Mm -hmm. He walked over to me and said something to me. Yeah, I think yeah. sat with, with you on the bench for a little bit? I don't know. I don't remember him sitting there, but I remember him walking over to me. I remember him pulling back his coat and showing me that he was armed, and he asked me to go with him. But even though his face was familiar, and I knew he was connected to the state press, the newspaper, sure. and probably connected to, the Bates name was connected to the NACP, he was a stranger to yeah. me, and <laughs> so I didn't go with him. <laughs> Listen to mom, don't go with strangers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so um, if we could back up a little bit again, um, you mentioned um, when this is edited, you're going to have to put bits and pieces together. 
<laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> to make a cut continuity. Um, you, you mentioned talking about news and things like that around the, the, around the dinner table. Um, so were you familiar with um, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education decision? When Just in a down? very, very general way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I think it probably the uh, only direct connection I remember is that um, I remember schools in Hoxie were desegregated. Mm -hmm. I remember some news about that. And uh, it was in the spring of 1957 while I was at Dunbar, the Negro, new Negro high school that had been built, um, that I, I learned that Central was going to be desegregated. Mm -hmm. And the teachers said that those of us who would be interested should sign this list, and so I did. But I certainly knew that I'd have to have my parents' permission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that was, the, you said, the spring of 57. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I, I, when I was at Dunbar, I was in the 10th grade. Okay. And um, so you signed a, a list, put your name on a list, about wanting to um, attend Central. Do you remember if um, you had to fill out any type of a questionnaire for the... No, I don't remember filling out a questionnaire. Okay. just remember signing up to, uh, as interested in going. <clears throat> and I think you mentioned earlier about having a meeting with the superintendent uh, prior to attending um, Central. Were your parents with you at that meeting? Uh, I think so, probably so. Um, I, uh, the only thing I remember about um, what the principal, what the superintendent had said be, at some point was that he would make this final selection and that those chosen had not had to be good students and not and not troublemakers. I was a good student because that was what was required of the experts. <laughs> so at that point were there more than nine students under consideration? Oh yes, yes yeah. there were okay. a lot of students. Probably more than a hundred. Okay. Do you remember um, when you found out uh, that Governor Falbus was going to send in the National Guard? Uh, I remember we watched television the night before. Um, we had been, you know, watching the news, and I remember that the governor went on television. He said something about calling out that he expected violence, and um, he called out the Arkansas National Guard to preserve peace and order or something yeah. like that. Um, and our going to school was delayed. Um, this, uh, I think the uh, superintendent asked us not to go to school uh, the day that it opened mm -hmm. and asked that our parents not accompany us. Uh, somehow he said that adults would, would, would um, instigate, their presence would instigate more violence, mm -hmm. uh, I guess. And so uh, that's why I showed up alone. Besides that, we weren't a group of people. Right. We were individuals acting individually. So um, when you heard that the National Guard was going to be there, your reaction was? I thought that they were there to protect all of the students. Yeah. In fact, you know, I, I di it didn't even occur to me that they wouldn't protect me. Mm -hmm. I, that wasn't even a, a possibility in my mind. Mm -hmm. By the way, I was in Lincoln, Nebraska at a teacher's seminar and they had some materials and they had a picture of a National Guardsman walking with me and this is something that Craig Rains has said he had a picture of. And when he showed me the picture, it was a National Guardsman walking away from me. And I've looked at archival footage mm -hmm. of that time. I never saw a 
National Guardsmen walking with me. Nobody wrote that a National Guardsman was walking with me, yet there is, exists a picture of a National Guardsman walking with me with some material somebody has, has promulgated. Hmm. Um, maybe uh, sometime we will s can sit down in the archives um, here. We've got some of the footage. Um, we've got footage from two of the television stations. And then I have these um, photographs that a student um, photographer for either the Central Yearbook, I think it was the Central Yearbook took? Charles Teague was in my history class, and I remember him being right in front of me as I was walking. Oh, excellent. You know who take the photographs. Yeah, Charles <laughs> Teague. Oh. Okay, so we'll have to take a look at those. T-E-A-G-U-E. -E. Um, he sat across from me in another row in Miss Penton's history class. Okay. And a later, m many years later, I saw a picture of me standing at the desk of the history teacher. And I do remember yeah. briefly that, that we saw a flash one day, and this was a, a picture taken surreptitiously by a student. Really? Yes. It's in one of Will Count's uh, publications. Yeah. Yeah. I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. the, with the photo, but I didn't know. That's really interesting. So yeah, we'll have to go through some of those photographs because I'm sure you know <laughs> a lot more about them um, than we do. So, um, oh, you asked me once about the Thanksgiving picture, po obviously post picture, Thanksgiving dinner oh, at, at the, the Bates. Bates house, and and was that a Wiley Branton? And I saw another photo of uh, identifying Wiley. Branton. That is Wiley Branton. Oh, okay. The senior. Um, sure. Uh, who's in that at the one end of the table? in that photograph. Okay. Um, so I don't, uh, I, let me go back for a second because I, no, I don't right. want to. They're going to have to piece it together anyway. <laughs> don't want to put, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Mm -hmm. So you don't remember walking, having anybody from the National Guard walk with you? No, I don't, any, I don't remember anybody walking with me. I remember okay. there was a pack a press in front of me with cameras mm -hmm. in my face and people howling directly behind me. Mm -hmm. I felt like they were right on my heels. And um, when you went to, um, uh, when you were able to get to the bus bench and, and sit down, you've uh, mentioned, um, uh, mentioned Mr. Bates. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember anyone else speaking yeah. with you? Yeah, Terrence Roberts walked over to me because he had come by himself and asked me uh, mm -hmm. would I walk with him. Well, you know, in junior high school, I used to walk par part of the way that Terrence walked home, mm -hmm. and I knew that he would turn off before the bridge. And I didn't want to walk away from there with anybody because I felt like Wasn't if I was you, walking, there would be fewer people to see what ha might happen to me. Right, right. So Absolutely. the bus, bus in many ways meant safety to me, getting on the bus mm -hmm. meant safety to me. That's what I fastened on as I was walking um, to, sure. to the bus stop. Sure. Um, any of the reporters talk to you? I remember um, people that I was, who were later identified as Homer Biggers and um, Benjamin Fine, mm -hmm. who were later identified as education writers for the Washington Post and New York Times. Right. And I remember them being right beside me and talking to me. And one may have put a hand on my shoulder comforting me. And I do remember one of them said, don't let them see you cry. Um, I think somebody took a picture, close-up picture, and even with those sunglasses on, they could see that I was, my eyes were tearing. Mm. Of course, the photos that were taken um, that day have, um, I think, become icons of the, yes, of the civil rights um, movement. In, in um, once on an Oprah show, they um, some of the pictures that AP had considered photographs of the century. Uh, some of the pictures were shown on that show, and um, what I called the mob scene picture. Mm -hmm that recurs in textbooks and documentaries um, was shown. AP promoted it at one of the 50 most important pictures mm -hmm. of the 20th century. Yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. 
So how does that make you feel? Well, I've always understood that the picture was famous, that I was not famous. The picture was famous. You know, I met Hazel Massery over a period of time. Mm -hmm. She would say peculiar things, but I, I came to the conclusion she thought she was famous. <laughs> the girl was screaming behind me with her face twisted right. in hatred. Right. She thought that she was famous. Mm. It's, it, it's interesting. I, as a, you know, as a historian and when I worked on the little exhibit at the Visitor Center, mm -hmm. um, people talked about I, a lot of the pictures um, a lot, but I was really struck by th that photo mm -hmm. being the one and, and the way people would talk about the photo, almost mm -hmm. like the photo has a life of itself. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, good photojournalism um, tells a story mm -hmm. that does not need to be reinterpreted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It captures emotion. That picture captures the emotion. It tells what was happening at that moment. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why it, it's, it still exists today. Um, so what... Uh, Tell me some um, about the days in between, um, you know, sort of from September 5th through September 24th. What were those Oh, there like? was a lot of uncertainty. We didn't know when we would get in school, where we would go to school, and we were waiting, and time, time seemed so important, the lost time seemed so important to, um, to us having success in school or being able to get into school, mm -hmm. it, it was it was um, it was really difficult to to to, to just keep waiting. Mm -hmm. It was really hard. And so, did you get help with the school? Work? Oh, we were we were waiting for for legal help from the NACP. Mm -hmm. Do you um, remember uh, getting to meet Thurgood Marshall and Oh yeah, Wiley yeah, um, I had a crush on him. <laughs> Yeah, I did. And I remember that I was surprised how salty he talked. <laughs> I was, and, and he was on, he's the only person I remember that talked to Daisy Bates in the way that he did. Yeah. <laughs> he took no guff from anybody. <laughs> so your mother wouldn't have approved of his mouth. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> mm -mm. And how, I mean, did he interact a lot um, with the Bates? I, I remember that. You know, I was shy, so when I met famous people, I really couldn't talk to them. I carried around an autograph hound, and that was a way I would connect with people, is to ask them to give me, give me the autograph. But I remember having a couple conversations with Thurgood Marshall once on the steps of the Supreme Court when we were posing for a picture. Mm -hmm. He told me, never, never, never be the one on the end. <laughs> I was, though. <laughs> He said, well, if you're on end, you can be chopped off. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, um, talk, I don't remember the exact conversation, but talking, uh, talking to him sitting on the couch in Daisy Bates' living room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember those two times seeing him. Um, okay, so we'll move forward to um, September um, 25th, and why don't you tell me about... Um, what that day was like. Especially. Okay, it's on September 25th. We were had been gathered at Daisy Bates' house, and there were some Negro reporters there. By the way, I use terms that we used then. Mm -hmm. And I explained to kids that, that I used the terms that are historically accurate, and that they have always that we have always struggled to define ourselves in this country, and that there have always been generational differences. That I, I explained to them why I keep using the term black, mm -hmm. and they use the term African-American. I tell them, I actually know some Africans. <laughs> I'm close <laughs> and personal, <laughs> and Africa's not a country. It's, it's a continent with many different ethnicities. <laughs> when I did the Dunbar exhibit, and we sort of you know, had a lot of the same questions on terminology, mm -hmm. and um, Dr. Davis said, um, I guess I don't really care what you call me, as long as it is with, res with respect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so you're waiting at Daisy Bates' house for the Army to come, I guess, to pick you up? 
No, before that, on the 23rd, we had been gathered at the base, base house, and we went, went by cars mm -hmm. in groups to Central, and we got in a, a, par, a door at the far end, well away from the crowd. Right. Um, the crowd was down at the 14th Street end, we went in the mm -hmm. 16th Street end. Um, but when we were gathered to go to school after we had been taken out, um, and we were there with the military, we went in a military convoy. I remember we were in a army, I remember at one point, I don't know if it was the first day or another day, one point we were in a military van that was, you know, that olive green, and there was a gun mounted jeeps fore mm -hmm. and aft. Um, and and I remember the soldiers walking us up those steps, and there were students who were kind of like in a barricade, and the soldiers went right through them. I felt like I, that was a triumphant moment for me to have our protectors just, <laughs> just have a part, That's right. like part in the Red Sea. <laughs> <laughs> Much better than the than the twenty third. Yeah, and the students were chanting, two, four, six, eight. We don't want to integrate. And we developed this line to ourselves, 8, 9, 10, the guards will take us in. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I like that. Um, so um, what do you remember about um, sort of the, the school part of all of this? Um, what classes? Okay, the first time we went in, September 23rd, um, students were in classes. There was mm -hmm. nobody in the hallway. And so we went to the, look for the principal's office, and um, and then uh, we went went to various classes from there. We had been enrolled over the summer by the registrar mm -hmm. without having ever gone into the school. Hmm. And so they just took you to your took you all to your classes. I, I don't know whether individuals took us to our classes or they gave us the room numbers. Uh -huh. I don't remember anybody escorting me to a class. Mm -hmm. Um, as big as that building is, it, it may, they might, there may have been somebody showing us the way mm -hmm. on either day, either mm -hmm. the 23rd or the 25th. So um, on the 25th, you didn't have soldiers take you to your class? I don't remember that. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember that. And in fact, my memory of the soldiers is that they were always well away from me when I was at a locker. They were like across the hall. And it, until I went back into the building years later, it seemed like they were so far oh, away. Right. Sure. Wow. They were never close to us. And so um, then perhaps this idea of the soldiers as protectors is not really I correct. Think, I think their presence kept adults from being able to get in the building. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and I know that, the, that there were some instances when they actually intervened. Mm -hmm. um, or, uh, I heard of an incident where two, two or three of the boys were being knocked down and kicked in the hallway, and so just pulled the attackers off them. Mm -hmm. I heard that story, and I heard the story of uh, the soldier um, dousing Gloria Ray into the water fountain as somebody was about to throw acid on her. A teacher screamed and that alarmed the soldier. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I remember those th hearing those things, but I don't ever recall them. The only time a soldier intervened for me is when I grabbed a girl in the spring, as I, you know, that the had slammed into me, mm -hmm. and um, he told me to let her go. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, "Don't tell me don't th that you didn't see that." Mm -hmm. Because there had been times when the National Guardsmen said, would report that they didn't see what we saw. Mm -hmm. But they were there. Mm -hmm. Sure. In fact, I was riding a cab um, a couple of years ago with somebody, and they were telling me that they had a relative who lived in Sheridan who had been a National Guardsman. He, he could tell me what actually happened there. I said, I'd love to talk to him because I was there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never heard any more from that. Yeah. <laughs> at all. I gave him my card when he could contact me. But I never heard anymore about that. So how did you go back every day? Well, 
it, you know, for a while we thought things would get better. Mm -hmm. Daisy Bates kept telling us things <laughs> would get better. After a while, it was so frustrating, we knew nothing was going to change. We stopped reporting to the vice principals. We had to report, you know, incidences, you know, combination of incidences every day. We stopped doing that because it was, it was fruitless. It was, it was pointless. The principal didn't pay attention to anything that, unless a teacher reported that corroborated what we said. Even when Minnie Jean's mother told, saw her being kicked, he didn't do anything. They had, students had free, free, they could just do anything and nothing happened. In fact, you know, in 96 I went back to the library to see what I could find that had been written and in the books I found, I don't think anybody was ever prosecuted for anything. No. I, the police arrested the, a few people um, on the 20, 23rd, mm -hmm. um, but nobody was ever prosecuted. No. So your strength came from your family, your fellow students? Well, eventually it came because we had to hold on. We realized that whether or not desegregation would proceed was up to us. We'd seen instances in the past where it, it just collapsed, mm -hmm. and it was the end of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is something I tell young people that when you have to do something that's really, really hard, if the motive goes beyond yourself, it allows you to hold on a little bit longer, try to hold on a little bit longer. But honestly, Going back every day was difficult. It was a decision you, had to, you would have to make every day. Mm -hmm. And some, there were some days that it was, you tried to hold on to the next class and through cl class after that. I remember one day I just couldn't do it. I called my grandfather to come get me. And I remember my grandfather, he was a very plain spoken man. Um, in, in fact, throughout my childhood, he's the only Negro I remember talking to white people honestly, without trying to not hurt their feelings. Not right. Uh, uh, he said to the principal, "You mean you can't control these children?" My grandfather said that. And did Mr. Matthews say? I don't that? remember what he said. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember what he said. So is is. Was there anyone in um, in the school working, you know, for the school district at that point um, that was helpful? That you well, Mrs. Um, Huckabee, the girls' vice principal, always was sympathetic, mm -hmm. but she never did anything she that helped anything. us. Sure, she always talked sympathetically. Um, there were there were there were pe two people at the end of the day in my speech class who engaged me all the time. Mm -hmm purposefully, and um, I knew they were sticking in exile. I didn't know what it was going, to, what it was costing them, costing them, but I knew it was costing them something, so much so that when I started to talk to them about them in the early 60s, at first I didn't identify them because I thought that there would be some negative repercussions to the, them and their, and their families. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel safe to identify them until around 1963, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so who, who were they? Um, Ann Williams, who I later learned, I, I talked to her mother in later years, that um, she and her family didn't live in Little Rock, uh, but they lived on a farm outside the city. Um, but I, many, many years later, I learned that her father was in the first, Central's first class, 1927, uh, E. Granger Williams, and that he was the president of the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. Commerce when the public rhetoric yeah. of civic leaders start to, started to change. Yeah. Yeah. And his uh, wife, Frances, was um, a when, member of the uh, WEC. Well, I didn't know that until, you know, 98 or so. Mm -hmm. um, so Ann Williams and... And Ken Reinhardt. Ken Reinhardt. And I didn't know until I saw Ernest... Uh, one of the graduation pictures of Ernest Green, but Ken was a, was a senior, mm -hmm. and he was standing in this photo um, near Ernest, and in the in the background you could see a b bunch of students 
talking conspirationally and looking at them because Ken was standing near Ernest. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, but, and I reconnected with them, met them in 96, Ken, mm -hmm. Ken Reinhardt and uh, Ann Williams, and told them what this had meant to me. They, at the time, they said that they didn't realize that this would, meant so much to me. Ann said that she looked back there and saw me sitting all alone. Mm -hmm. And that's why she reached out to me. Mm -hmm. um, she was exercising the golden rule. Treat others as you would want them to treat you. And Ken, just in his personality, was a spiritual person. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, and later years, he became a minister before he became a banker. <laughs> <laughs> He's retired now. But uh, he and his wife live in um, um, near Hilton Head in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Um, what about all the other students? I mean, were, were they sympathetic? Were they not sympathetic? Well, when, we, when we first went into school, there were, there were friendly overtures from students in every class. There was somebody who was friendly. Mm -hmm. There were always people calling your names. Um, but there were some people just, like in my history class, there was one guy who obviously was not connected <laughs> to the organized attackers. Mm -hmm. He greeted me every day, and then he was through harassing me. He, his, <laughs> he started every day with his greeting, and then he was through with me. <laughs> and he was just somebody who was, wasn't connected right, at all. Right, right. Get his two cents. But um, I remember, I remember this history class more than any other class because it had the sons and daughters of the local gentry in that class. Mm -hmm. And the superintendent's daughter was in that class. Mm -hmm. And I remember that I always saw the backs of the students. The only student I ever said anything to was Charles Teague, and I asked him about the picture where I stuck my, stuck my tongue out of <laughs> him. Did he, did he use it? He said no. <laughs> <laughs> when he, you know, when he was with these photographers in front of me, for a long time I disliked the press very much. I can imagine. <laughs> uh, Until I better, uh, better understood what their role was to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so people have talked about, well, you know, there is an organized group, and they're the only ones that cause trouble, and all there were other people who, who. who when we were being hurt, obviously, felt like we, we were getting what we deserved. But the majority of people turned their backs, and I didn't see them react to what they had to have heard, had to have seen. Yeah. So it couldn't have... There were a lot of silent witnesses. In fact, the majority of them were silent witnesses. Because, I say that because the attacks on a, most of the attacks on us happened in the hallways. Mm -hmm. Majority of them happened in the hallways. I remember when we were scalded in the gym shower. Back then they didn't have any partitions in the gym shower. Mm -hmm. It was just open. But I didn't hear a peep out of the girl on the right of me or the left of me. So they had to have been worn before their water turned suddenly scalding hot. Mm -hmm. They had to have been warned. Even if they weren't the perpetrators, right. they had to have no. There wasn't a not one tiny exclamation of surprise when that would happen. How often in, during the school day did you um, come in contact with um, uh, the other members of the Nine? Only at lunch and gym. Mm -hmm. after, uh, I, after, I was in gym with Minnie, Minnie Jean, and after she was expelled, um, they put Carlotta in my gym class. And so I would see one, each of us would at least see at least one in gym. I think all the boys probably had, were in the same gym class. And, um, and then we would see each other at lunch. And people wouldn't sit at tables near us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they wouldn't even sit near us, right, let alone at the table with us. Mm -hmm. Ken said that he sat at the table once with Jefferson Thomas. And Jeff said that he thought Ken was a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, so
so um, one of the things I guess that happened during um, the year was uh, you, um, I guess Daisy Bates became um, a resource for all she of She represented the NACP in our eyes mm -hmm. because she, she was the, the one interacting with us all the time. Right. Um, and we thought we thought something would happen when we reported what happened to, to us. It didn't make a bit of difference. Not one bit of difference. So has um, has her role been exaggerated? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because when I look back and, and read her book, um, I don't Long Shadow. Know, Long Shadow of Little Rock. She phrases it such that people get the impression that she was connected with us before. Mm -hmm. And that she, that, she, that she provided training and leadership. Actually, the only training we had was our parents training us to be whoever we were. And Jim Lawson uh, came down from Nashville and get taught, get, after we had been in school, uh, taught us some nonviolent techniques. Hmm. That's the only person who purposely gave us some training, other than the way we were raised. So, more a case of maybe her house being used as a place just to go and hang out? Well, it was our connection with NACP mm -hmm. because the NACP's legal help was important. Mm -hmm. But um, she had no, really, no connection in directing um, how the cases would go or anything like well, that. Well, right, yeah. I, you yeah. know, uh, um, our par some of our parents were very impressed with her, but nobody was that, that naive. Yeah. <laughs> Well, some of our parents were very, very naive. Uh, my mother was was lot, was so impressed with David Daisy Bates. She a couple of times went over her house and cleaned her house for her. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my father felt like uh, she was one of the few people sticking the necks out for us. By the way, if you get an interview from my father, you really will have done something. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he talked to um, Melba Patillo um, for a, a little story she did in 97. But other than that, he won't return post a phone call. Well, so I, actually, I haven't gotten um, none of the parents mm -hmm. have given interviews. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mrs. Walls. Um, said she will, but you know, since she's in Colorado, we mm -hmm. haven't uh, been able to do that yet. Um, outside, of, outside of Central and, and school um, during that year, how much did um, you know, your, your life with other people um, change? Well, my life really didn't change very much because um, um, we went to church, but we went to church together. Mm -hmm. It wasn't any place I went by myself, no. except uh, for when my siblings were in school and I was out of school, I was at my grandpa's house, mm -hmm. a store, or, or I was at the mother sheds. Mother trusted the mother sheds enough to allow me to go there. <laughs> <laughs> my father took me and my father picked me up. Mm -hmm. Once though, my mother told me not to ride the school, not to ride the city buses. And it was well into the summer, I guess, or late spring. And I figured it doesn't matter now. Mm -hmm. You know, in the year schools were out. Um, so I got on the bus, and lo and behold, when it was getting close to the time for me to get off, so I heard somebody say, there's that such and such. Mm -hmm. And when I got off, they got off with me and threw rocks at mm -hmm. me. But within a block, I was in the heart of an old black part, part of town, so they left me. Mm -hmm. My attackers did. Mm. Um, the summer. Oh, there was only one instance that was ever published in the newspaper, and that was um, when they were throwing rock filled snowballs at us as we were trying to leave school. Mm. That's the only thing that ever was in the local paper, I think. Gracious. And my father had a hard time getting across the street to me. And a guard, a guard stuck back inside the building. Eventually, we did too. Um, the summer following the 
year of the crisis, the 57-58 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. school year. Um, did well, you we went on these treks across the country. Well, that's what I was going to ask about. Well, that, that was a relief for us to get away from Little Rock. Um, you know, I, I guess they were fundraisers for the NACP, because everywhere we went it was something connected to the NACP. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just surmise that these were fundraisers for the NACP. At one point we were somewhere when the improved benevolent something of the Elks um, announced that they were giving scholarships to each of us. And um, I remember when I was in New York, met Mayor somebody. Um, I met Dag Hamashow and I was really impressed. Mm -hmm. He was um, Secretary General of the UN. Yeah. And he signed my little autograph dog. <laughs> It was at some lunch or something other, and um, that, my, I really couldn't connect with people. I was socially awkward. I really was, besides being shy. I was socially awkward. So, because um, a, a couple of people have talked about going to, to New York that summer. Mm -hmm. and I remember it was, uh, Cleveland, New York, and Chicago. I remember those three places. Okay. And I remember Cleveland because later on when I went to all, an old black college, or majority black college, there were a couple people who said they remembered me from that summer. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. who, a couple of Ohioans. Um, I think right in, I guess it would have been in the, the late spring, early part of the, the summer, um, the NAACP awarded um, you all their highest um, honor, the mm -hmm. Spengarn. Spengarn. Um, metal and um, there is a story that you all refused to take it uh, if Mrs. Bates was I think not there awarded. were some parents who wrote letters like that mm -hmm. who had been urged to and wrote letters like that but the only thing I remember that there was this woman somebody from who, who worked for the Harlem something newspaper mm -hmm. and she tried to get us to say that Daisy Bates was like a mother to us and we refused to do that <laughs> around that time but that was happening so that was a so, but but I, I I was completely unaware of this campaign to uh, to to make the NACP give her the spend gun too. Mm -hmm. I wasn't wasn't aware of that at all. Hmm. Interesting. I, probably my daddy was probably one of the ones, or my mother, or maybe both, who wrote a, le a letter in her favor to mm -hmm. the NACP. And and probably Mr. Thomas, um, Jefferson Thomas's father. And maybe the mother sheds, but cl very clearly, Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Patillo were not naive. Um. So, uh, the summer of '58 is over, and it's time to go back to school. And all of a sudden, the schools end up closed for the. 58-59 uh, um, school year. So, mm -hmm. um, what did you uh, do that year? I remember I saw a lot of lot of Daisy Bates and was at her house a lot. And I remember that she was giving scholarships to people, um, passing along scholarships to people, so that some kids could go to boarding schools outside of Arkansas. It wasn't. It was many many years later that I realized that these things had probably been tendered for us. By then, um, there were at least four or five of the nine still in Little Rock. Some families had, had left because the parents had lost their livelihood. Right. They left without any assistance from the NACP. So she had something vested in trying to keep you all in Yeah, people used to, used to contact her, her to connect with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, persist, that pattern persisted well into the 60s. And I t asked somebody, why, why are you c contacting her to get to me? I was angry by that time. And um, what about, uh, did, the, um, did you all ever come in contact with the, the national office of the NAACP? I mean, did only, they only when we went to a national convention and were given the Spengarn medals. Mm -hmm. um, that was my only contact with them. Mm -hmm. um, there was a man named Clarence Laws who was a, a regional director mm -hmm. for something for Arkansas and Louisiana that I, that I saw occasionally in Little Rock. Mm -hmm. And then the NACP attorneys, um, 
Wally Branton, um, uh, Thurgood Marshall, and, and um, Chris uh, Mercer. And did you know? Um, Chris Mercer was the only attorney who really talked to us about the case or about what would happen, mm -hmm. what, what they anticipated happening. Because we, you know, we had this anxiety about when we would get in school. So he told us how long we could be out of school and still be able to go to school. Uh, what the what the cutoff point right. was. Right. Yeah. But no, but, but um, sometimes when I'm around Wally Branton Jr., I sense that he's somewhat chagrined that we don't have an anecdote about his father. Mm -hmm. His father didn't talk to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you remember um, a Simpson Tate from Dallas? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did did some of the early um, work mm -hmm. uh, in. Um, Aaron V. Cooper. Well, I didn't. I didn't testify. Uh, the I went to Justice Department and I gave a deposition, mm -hmm. but I didn't testify. I remember that there was one line, one word that was that was inaccurate. And after this stenographer had typed it all up, I just couldn't say that that was, that that I made a mistake here and have her do it all over again. <laughs> I said something like, "I got off the bus at 13th Street," and I went, "I got off the bus at 12th, 12th uh -huh. Street." Uh -huh. I, that was the error. Do you remember being interviewed by the FBI? That probably was when we were at the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so during the last year, you remained in Little Rock, and um, did you? I took correspondence high school courses. Okay. Uh, French from the University of uh, Missouri, and English, and some some other subject. Oh, algebra! <laughs> from 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 from. Uh, um, University of Arkansas at Fayetteville and had these correspondence courses. And we had, I had a tutor. We had volunteer tutors from Belanda Smith College. And my, t oh, this is one, th one thing that I had a little, this one social thing I, my mother allowed me to do. Art Dennis would take me to the building that's on the state capitol grounds that um, had something with Arkansas Education Association. Mm -hmm. Well, they had a foreign film club that met once a month. Mm -hmm. And so I got to go see these films. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, and the sort of near the end of um, the lost year, there's a big dust up in the in the press because of um, this teacher purge uh, yeah, from the uh -huh. from the school board. I, I think it was the uh, purge of those 44 teachers and administrators and the closing of the schools, those two things made white people feel like they were involved when they didn't feel like it, this, this involved them at all before. So that's what it took to, to yeah. make my, them pay I think, attention. I think so. Make them speak up. Because before that, oh, the only voices you heard were the voices of the organized segregationists. Mm -hmm. and, and can you attribute that to anything? Um, uh, in in um, Elizabeth Jackaways, she was the first person, first, acad first academician to write about this in something she edited, um, paper she edited uh, on the subject. And her take was that um, was different from somebody else's. Somebody else said that probably what was happening was what the leaders wanted to happen, but they just didn't get out in front of the ugliness. Mm -hmm. That they were in agreement with what was happening, mm -hmm. or um, as in one of the women's emergency committee books or films, um, one of them gives the impression that the women um, became active because the men um, were more economically uh, vulnerable than the women would be. Mm -hmm. So, do you agree with that, or? Well, I can't rationalize for folk. I'm, I guess I'm just wondering how it appeared to you. Well, as a kid, I thought what was happening was what majority wanted to happen. Mm -hmm. um, when the lost year was over, um, you're one of the few that 
Went back to Central? I went back just that one day because Jeff was there by himself. Oh, okay. And, and my excuse for going back was that I needed to pick up some transcripts. Mm -hmm. I didn't intend to go back to go to school at mm -hmm. all. By then, I was set to go to college. Okay. So you um, went... Uh, oh, by the way, I'm, uh, the rest of the nines have, nine have high school diplomas, either from Central or from some of the school where the families m moved to. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get enough credits to get a diploma, so I went to college without a high school diploma. It was years later when I didn't have a, a BA or a, or a GED that a, a, a Army recruiter took me to Saline County <laughs> to take the test so that I could get the GED. Because hmm. apparently in Pulaski County, you couldn't, you couldn't just take the test and get right. the uh, right. GED. So that, that was done for, for, uh, because the military required women to have either a diploma or a GED. Okay. So I tell some students that, you know, in, one of the things I tell them that if you haven't been good to yourself, it's not too late. Education is your investment in yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so uh, where did you go to college? Uh, first school I went to was Knox College in Galesburg, Galesburg, Illinois. It's in the northwest corner of Illinois, a very small school. And again, there were only nine Negro students there. There were some other um, foreign students there. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a, a small school under under 3,000, still a small school. Um, and this, the two couple things that were important there. This is where I started to express my feelings because I was allowed to. And um, this is where I was popular for the first and only time in my whole life. <laughs> well, you know what, that, I, you can't imagine what that feels like to a shy person. <laughs> Your, your reputation preceded and, yourself. And this is something I tell kids. I said, uh, when you leave this school that you're in now, you can recreate yourself. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. If you're not in the in crowd now, you can be someplace else. Yep, absolutely. So how long were you at Knox College? Just one year, freshman year. year. The and next year I went to Central State in Wilberforce, Ohio. And, um, any particular reason for? Yeah, my, I, my scholarship was not going to be renewed at Knox because my grades weren't good enough and it was way too expensive. Uh, to, well, the scholarships didn't cover mm -hmm. enough for that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to a state school. And what was your major? At first I didn't have a major and then somebody asked me and I said, social work. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff where people think thought that I got a, some kind of degree in social work. But later on, because of, you know, I, I, for a poor person who college was a privilege to, I was a dilettante for a long time. I don't know how in the world I could do that, but, that, that, but really in essence I was. I took stuff I liked. I liked history and I liked French. So I took those you know, I wound mm -hmm. up with hours in that stuff. Mm -hmm. So after a while, when I really had to, had, to, had to for real do something, I became a history major. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> and you know what, when I was little, and I, when I was going to Stevens, my mother came home one day with a book on world history. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved, I guess it was when my love of history began. I think I was around, probably around the fourth grade and at Knox, they had this tradition of they test all the freshmen to see where they were academically. You know, not everybody had to take any English composition. There were a few people who started out with creative writing. I didn't test out of anything <laughs> except beginning French. I, actually, I and, and history. I didn't have to start off with, with a survey course in history. The exact same thing. I, I tested out of French and that, out of beginning French, and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, With the crisis behind you and, and um, time to um, reflect, um, how did the 
crisis um, leave you um, feeling about? Was, it was something that I felt like was no longer a part of my life for a long time. There are people who known me for years and did not connect me with that at all. Because mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's not something that usually comes up in conversation. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so, so I felt like it was not a part of my life. I didn't realize till probably in the 1980s that the impact that it had had on me. Because so I would have recurring depression. Um, but I, I didn't, never made the connection with that. I was never diagnosed with PTSD until 1980. Yeah, yeah. Probably the, uh, what do you call it, DSM? Diagnostic, oh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Manual, yeah. Pro probably by that time had, had got these clusters of syndromes that they considered, that they named PTSD, and they had thought that soldiers only had it, called it combat fatigue, probably right. in the 40s right. or so, 50s. Uh, so now I had something that I could name. Did that make it any better? Well, after many years after that, I realized I had to keep contact with, um, and that I had to stay on medicine. Um, you know, uh, it, it has made a difference. Yeah, it's made a difference. It wasn't until not the 1990s that I, that, that I started talking about what was actually like inside school. Um, I think even for Ernest, who's the most political, most out there of us. Um, he really hasn't come to terms with it. Mm -hmm. I, I met a, a, a children's book writer in summer of 96. Uh, I think I went to the MLK Center mm -hmm. and they had an exhibit on, the, on, on children, mm -hmm. the civil rights movement. Anyway, she said she had talked to him because she wrote a book about us. It says she was shocked to learn he didn't know how to tell his story. But he, he says today that he can't be locked in the past. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I guess, and, and I think now that I've interviewed everybody, I think everybody's dealt with it differently. differently. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because you all had, had different experiences. Mm -hmm. um, has it left you feeling about, you know, members of the, of, of, of the um, uh, white people differently? No, because I can't isolate that part of my life. I've had so many more experiences, experiences. with other ethnic groups right. uh, um, on a peer relationship. So, so that um, um, no, uh, no. In fact, you know, it's hard for me to remember the names of our of our most persistent attackers, but when somebody names a name, mm -hmm. there's immediate mo emotional memory. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I, I, can, I can remember names of a couple, two or about three of them, three or four of them. Mm -hmm. But other than that, mm -hmm. and then later on, I forget those names too. <laughs> now now that, is, that, that is one thing that has happened to me but I think is a, is a blessing, is that forgetting mm -hmm. of not being in my conscious mind at all. Mm -hmm. you know. And then finally, after struggling with the subject since 96, I have reached somewhat of a comfort level in talking about it. Plus, I met a researcher who says he's researched PTSD for 20 years and there's no cure, so I'm not looking for a cure anymore. <laughs> I, start, I start out trying to cure myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just work, work on it the best you can. Uh, it, is there a legacy of the crisis? I mean, I, let, I leave, leave that up to other people to determine. Leave that, that, that's for other people to say how, what its legacy has been. That's something other people can determine. Because I, I can't be um, objective enough to do that. If there was um, sort of one thing you wanted people to know about the crisis, not necessarily about you or oh, anything. Oh, when, when I talk to students, I just use the oral history as a framework. Mm -hmm. The three things I want them to know. 
that they are agents of change, that, that if they reach out to somebody who's being harassed, that they can be very powerful to those people. Mm -hmm. And um, that um, each of us is responsible for the kind of community we have. That even if they aren't the active people out there doing those things, they are, their silence allows them to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, those are the only th three things that are important to me to convey to other people. I think they're extremely important. A and for what it's worth, um, my perspective on the, as a historian is that um, the white community just kept telling themselves that nothing was going to happen. And then when it happened, they just kept saying, oh, it couldn't be happening, and that's why they didn't react. Well, there's some people who were in school at the time who claimed they, don't, they, they didn't know what was going on. But I would think that even in, in, in 1957, it's unusual to see violence in school and not have people so. talk about it among right. themselves. So of, of all the... Uh, what do you say to all the white students who say they were traumatized about that year? Oh, I have had, I, I do remember one girl told me she was scared. And I said, scared of what? And people have said that their parents told them not to get in trouble, not to get involved. And I know that uh, white students from that time um, struggle with, how, um, with how, what other people think of them. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to be their apologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, I think it just goes back to your, your points about mm. being agents of change. And that's another reason why I continue to struggle to try to talk about it. It's because I heard people changing what I knew to be real. Mm -hmm. Revisionist history. Mm. Anything else you would like to talk about or share? Mm -mm. It's about thank you for your patience. Oh, thank you. This has been wonderful. Okay.